And some heartache and pain And I laid on the ground And I looked up at the sky And I prayed to the Lord Up above and asked why But oh no, I'm not tired I'm not too marching yet And I'm a march until I die Oh children, this you can bet And we'll say I'm gonna sing out I'm gonna march on. Slave soldiers. I'm gonna march on. I'm gonna march on. Gonna put one foot in front of the other. I'm gonna sing out. Gonna march on. I got to keep on going. Well, my grandma marched and my granddaddy too, and I never thought it'd be something that I have to do. But I march if I must. I got a mission to see, and I'd be damned if my children have to march for me. I believe in the power of raising my voice, and I believe in the power of making some noise. And if I die, I can say, and if I can't say, I'll die. So we can sing for one another now. Let's give it a try, and we'll say, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna use my body for God. I'm gonna sing, 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 I'm
I thought I hit my mute button. Apologies all. So let me start over again. Hi, everyone. So once again, my name is Tracy King. I am a member of Old South Church in Boston and chair of Grace Speaks, a standing committee at Old South that promotes sacred conversations about matters of race within the life at Old South and in the community. It gives me great honor and pleasure to um, bring welcomes and greetings from both Old South as well as our co-sponsor of the evening, City Mission. City Mission in Old South has a wonderful legacy of over 205 years because um, City Mission was founded by lay and clergy members at Old South and Park Street churches in 1816. So tonight's conversation is going to be a joyful conversation about the documentary, The Black Church. The <clears throat> this is our story, this is our song. A documentary that was aired on local PBS stations last week. And we hope to have a wonderful conversation with our guest speakers. But before we get into that, I would like to offer up a word of prayer. So if you are able and, and could get yourself in a posture of prayer, please bow your head as I recite these words. Greeting God, thank you for the presence of everyone who is here. For each body, heart, mind, your steadfast love whispers over us. Fill us with your goodness and songs of joyful praise. In Thanksgiving, we sing a life brought out of death. We tell of strength up from sorrow. Through centuries, we carry the stories of hope and of home, of place and of name, mm. assured in your abundant reign. Mm. Receive our thanks and praise, O oh God. Ready us to make every moment of our learning, listening, and sharing tonight. Be with us now, we pray, in this Zoom meeting, in this Zoom gathering, as we celebrate generations of works and wonders you have given through the Black Church. Bless our panelists as they share and open our hearts to receive mm. the wisdom and insights that we will bring. Open our ears to hear one another in love, in, in words that are hard to, to say. Bless us, we pray, in this time together and lead us toward your hopeful future. Jesus Christ calls us to tell aloud the wonderful, wondrous story. And may your gracious love sing through us tonight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Tonight, um, we will have our conversation moderated by the Reverend Inez Dover. Reverend Dover is on the minister team at the historic Myrtle Baptist Church in West Newton and is the Minister of Worship and Arts, coordinating and facilitating the calendar of special events, liturgical service of worship and Sunday morning worship service. Reverend Dover is a graduate of the Boston, of Boston University and Andover Newton Theological School. She is a retired educator who taught English, speech and theater arts for 37 years in the Department of English at Newton North High School, where there is a Dover Legacy Scholar Program that is named in her honor, and I quote, dedicates a work to inspire excellence and involvement among children of color in the Newton Public School. Yeah. For 14 years, Reverend Dover taught the senior and junior English class for MIT Wellesley's Upward Bound Summer Program and receiving the Teacher of the Year Award for many, many years. Reverend Dover's works with continues to work with students on their theses for undergraduate and graduate programs and edits PhD candidates dissertations. Reverend Dover is the vice president of the city mission board of directors, as well as their nominating chair. And she serves on other various committees. She is married to her husband of 48 years with three children and three, three grandchildren. <laughs> but most importantly, she is a child of God who gives Jesus Christ the honor and the glory. 
welcome Reverend Dover. Thank you so much, Tracy. I'm just glad to, to be here. I um, <laughs> had sent a shorter version, so I'm surprised that all of that is, um, is that, that you said all of that. I am, you know, happy to, to <laughs> I'm proud of that, uh, but yet that is not the most important thing that I'm proud of. I'm proud that um, I'm just um, glad to be here and to be um, in your presence. Uh, and, and in God's presence. So I would like to first thank God for being here. I would like to say that we are, we are abundantly uh, happy and blessed to, um, with all of the things that are going on in our lives. It is important that we um, you know, thank uh, uh, you know, our spiritual divinity for the life that we have. I wanna welcome you all again and to our panel, of course, I want to welcome you and just tell you that uh, we are excited to hear from our three illustrious panel members. We're also so excited to have so many of you join us for this Black History Month presentation. I know many of you saw the exemplary PBS special by Dr. Henry Louis Gates on the Black Church. This is our story. This is our song. The title of Dr. Gates's book and the PBS documentary is a familiar and customary hymn sung in our black church. It is traditional. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir, heir of salvation and purchase of God, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song praising my savior all the day long. This is my so story, this is my song. And in the black church, we praise our savior all the day long. In Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Our panel tonight will be based on that special. Yet, if you did not get a chance to see it, do not worry because in the black church tradition, we are very used to extemporaneous and off the cuff interactions. You will hear responses that are candid and reflective of our panelists involvement in various connections and intersections of the black church. I am going to introduce our panel in order as we will ask them questions. On the city mission website and, and the, also the um, link that you used to get here our, you will see the long, illustrious bios of our panelists. Please take time to read those. I am going to read a shorter version because we want to give ch a time and chance for our panelists to respond. Our esteemed panelists are Reverend Mariama White Hammond, Reverend Daryl L. Goodwin, and Reverend Alicia Johnson. I am only reading a short piece from their bios in respect for the time. Reverend Mariamo White Hammond, and also I've left off, our, our, our other panelists is Reverend Alicia Marie Johnson. Reverend Mar Mariamo White Hammond is the founding pastor for New Roots AMA Church in Dorchester. New Roots is a multiracial, multi-class community that is innovating new ways of being a church. She is an advocate for ecological and social justice youth engagement and spirit-filled organizing. Reverend Marima Ama is active in secular and interfaith justice efforts. In particular, she uses an intersectional lens in her ecological work, challenging folks to see the connection between immigration and climate change, or the relationship between energy policy and economic justice. I see that all three of these uh, panelists are, are gonna give me a, a, a run for my money as far as an English uh, teacher. The Reverend Daryl L. Goodwin is a Chicago native and serves as the first executive conference minister of the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. As the chief vision keeper, he is responsible for guiding the conference and its affiliates to have a positive and lasting impact in our world. Reverend Goodwin is currently a doctoral candidate 
His dissertation topic is praying through using group spiritual direction as a strategy for the retention of African-American men in predominantly white seminaries in the United Church of Christ, UCC. Now, our last panelist is one of my pastors at the historic Myrtle Baptist Church, and that is the Reverend Alicia Marie Johnson, who serves as the assistant pastor of Myrtle Baptist Church in West Newton. As a spiritual leader, theologian, and educator, she is committed to finding sustainable, creative, and ethical ways to build healthy and thriving individuals and communities. Reverend Johnson's mission to catalyze healing, justice, and reconciliation is not limited to the walls of Myrtle Baptist Church. In addition to her work in pastoral ministry, she works in the field of educational neuroscience currently serving as the assistant director of the MIT Wellesley Upward Bound Program. Note that I may call on our executive director, the Reverend June Cooper to respond at times. So welcome panelists. In Dr. Gates book, The Black Church, he says, and I quote, the black church in a society in which the color line was strictly policed Anoint, amounted to a, a world within a world, providing practical, physical, and social outlets and economic resources for local African-American communities. The Black church was the proving ground for the nourishment and training of a class of leaders. It fostered community bonds and established the first local, regional, and then national Black social networks. So, first panelists, as we know, the generalization of black church is just like that, the generalization of black folk. It is complicated and complex. There is diversity, individualism, and uniqueness. So please tell us your definition of the black church and then tell us your first relationship with the black church. We're gonna start with Reverend Mariama. Thank you. So I, you know, just as a, as a way for me to create clarity. I, I talk about um, the Black uh, church tradition uh, because I think there are some things we have in common or there are threads that are in common, but to um, call the Black church is to, uh, to imagine that there's this one single monolithic institution and that's certainly not true. So do are there threads that um, you will find between um, black churches, absolutely. Is there some mega institution that unites all of us? Absolutely not. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I consider myself a, a child of the black church tradition. Um, I, I came up in the AME church, although my father, um, my father's father was a Baptist minister. And I think my grandmother was driven to, um, much fasting and praying when she heard that her son was leaving the Baptist church to go to the AME church, but she, she finally accepted it. Um, I think she said, you know, better than he leave there and, and go into the streets, I guess I can uh, live with it. Um, and then in her, the latter part of her life, she actually was an active member at, at our AME church, but she was always a Baptist in her heart. Um, and, you know, so I think that um, the, um, there is a spirituality, I think, um, particularly a focus on the ancestors. I grew up reading Hebrews um, 12, 1. I mean, we just heard it, you know, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. That was just like a thing like that. And I came to find later on, you know, as I was in seminary, people who would like never heard that scripture before, right? Um, for us, this was a reclamation of an ancestral tradition that in some of our you know, cultural tradition predates a full engagement with Christianity. And I say in some of our traditions because the truth is there have been black Christians as long as there have been Christians, right? Um, Ethiopia, strong, old Christian tradition, parts of Congo, strong, old Christian tradition. So um, not all black uh, Christianity came through white missionaries. But we cannot deny 
that that is also a part. Um, and so uh, again, the tradition is wider, um, you know, having had an opportunity to worship in um, with Ethiopian Christians, having had an opportunity to worship in the Coptic church, it is erasure to not name that we have black people have had traditions that are ancient. Um, and I celebrate the tradition that I came up in, which is African-Americans in this country, um, creating a, a, a spiritual and theological center um, that took what was given to them, which was often um, oppressive theology, and out of it created something where um, they recognize um, that God is a God of justice, God is a God of liberation, that even when the larger society did not see them, God saw them. Um, and so uh, one of the things I think is a beautiful part of the Black church tradition is the belief that God sees those who others do not. Now we're gonna have time later on to talk about how in our institutional practice, we have also sometimes not seen people for their fullness. Um, we have not honored the fullness of their dignity. Um, but I, I do think um, that theological tradition is beautiful and strong, even if at times uneven and not fully fulfilled. Thank you, Reverend. In the black tradition, we say amen. Amen, yes. All right, Reverend Goodwin, you're on. Well, I feel a little bit of peer pressure because of Reverend June Cooper. <laughs> so when I think about the black church, I think about a sound. And if I were to compartmentalize my experience, it's something like this, yes. Yes, 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 Lord. And then I can go in after that. <laughs> I think central to the Black experience of faith and church was a yes. Yes to something that was greater than everything around us. Yes to something greater than the immediacy of the Black experience in this particular country. Uh, for my ancestors, you know, for my ancestors, it was yes was greater than picking somebody else's cotton on a sharecropping plantation. Um, yes to my great great grandmother who decided that she would be a midwife. Um, and sneak through the backwoods of Mississippi to help Black folk birth their children. And then somehow walk miles and miles on a dirt road to a little building, which we might have experienced as a shack, but was their spiritual power center, where somehow they gained the strength to then go back to, in, in my grandmother's words, old Mr. Johnson's land um, and still do the work that would sustain who they were. Um, my foundation was in the Church of God in Christ, where my great grandfather uh, was a minister. Um, and my family was sort of situated in this understanding that there was a spirituality that sort of reached down into the depths of your soul. And out of it came this yes, this sense of yielding to a power greater um, than I think anything that we could have imagined. When I think about the Black church experience, I, I think about a difference between Jesus and the Christ. Um, I want to spend a little bit, a, a little moment talking about Jesus. There was something in the Black church experience about calling on the name of Jesus, which was a, yes, spiritual figure, but a, spir a figure that was also tangible. Uh, a, a figure who also knew exactly what you were going through, a, a figure who also could understand the very groanings of the depths of your soul. And so when there was a call to Jesus, there was some sense that Jesus understood all about my troubles, like everything that I was going through because of because of his stripes, because of his wounds, because of everything Jesus went through, there was this immediate identification of that suffering, but then also this triumphant understanding. Versus if I were to compare it, I think to a more Eurocentric understanding of the Christ, 
um, which is sort of a sanitized, cleaner version. It's sort of the after uh, Resurrection Sunday version of, of Jesus, uh, since that everything is okay and I'm you know, worrying about the birds and the air and, and those particular things. And you don't hear that in black gospel music. Nobody's singing about you know, the birds or the, any of that kind of stuff, you know, the trees. We aren't talking about that. We're talking about, did my Lord deliver Daniel, right? You know, did my Lord sort of open up the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing that I had not room enough to receive because there was this sense that again, something is greater than me. Um, the Black Church for me um, at Pentecostal Temple Church of God in Christ on the south side of Chicago, um, it was, it is that sense that you were talking about. It was the commons. Um, it was the place where you got leadership formation. It was the place where you learned speech and debate. Um, it was the place where you learned recitation. It was the place where you learned memorization. Um, it was a foundational understanding for many of us where, you know, we learned how to read better at church than maybe what was happening um, at school. And it offered you a lens um, into a world. You know, when I think about my life today, you know, um, as a professional minister um, in a predominantly white denomination that has things, you know, where they're fundraising and there's opportunities for you to go to auction. Well, I had an auction at 10 and it was called the church tea. Um, and you went around and you bid on cakes <laughs> and you did those kind of things. But it was a formation that somehow in the black church, you were being prepared for a world that even at 10, I couldn't have imagined. But I know how to do the auction because I auctioned Mother Johnson's tea cakes. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I could preach extemporaneously and talk in front of a crowd of 100 because, you know, at five, I had to get up before the people and, and do my speech. And the saints were uh, generous. And then they also had a couple of words for you <laughs> afterward. Some of them were breathe better, baby, or, you know, articulate your words so that people can hear you in the back. You know, there was this sense of willing and working. So there was the spiritual, but there was also the natural. There was the invitation for you to glean for what God had offered you, but you also had tools that I couldn't have translated at the time. And that was so much of what I appreciated about the series, that sense that we were getting this sense that the Black church was this core foundation that was offering people a bridge, a bridge to something that was to come, but also tools of what they needed in the immediacy of this moment. Amen, Reverend Goodwin. Yeah, let the church say amen. Uh, now, Reverend uh, Johnson. All right. Um, I just want to uh, take a moment very briefly to echo what's already been said. I think that, that that's already been said very well, so I don't I won't go back and repeat um, what, uh, what my colleagues have said. It, it, they were they shared beautifully. Um, I think that where where I just want to sort of uh, push the point was uh, when Reverend Goodwin started talking about the sound of Black church. It's, it's the thing that still holds me. Um, I grew up a deacon's child in a Black Baptist church in Athens, Georgia. And uh, I remember uh, Dr. Cheryl Townsend Jilk saying that it's one of the finest ethnographic experiences and opportunities you'll ever have is to be a deacon's child. I know a lot of people talk about being a PK, uh, but in a Baptist church, being a deacon's child because the deacon is the closest thing to the pastor most often. Um, beside associate ministers, because we didn't really have any when I was growing up. Um, it was my daddy. He was he was the next, more or less the assistant pastor of the church. And you have these opportunities to um, be imprinted upon. And while that can be very traumatic for some people and in some ways that I'm sure we'll get into uh, um, at some point later, um, those things come back to me now. Um, the smell of the Bible and the hymnals as we were going through and saying that the church covenant uh, before communion, that's why I know it now because I said it every first Sunday that I can remember until I was 18 years old. I don't, you know, I don't, it only took me about two weeks when I got to Myrtle to, to remember it again um, because it's there, you know, and so you do have those sort of first and formative experiences. I don't know what y'all gonna do with this recording, so I'm not gonna say no names, but my first crush was it was in a black church. You know, I, you have these kinds of moments where you're, you're trying to figure out um, who you are in the context of these people. And it's as much cultural practice and the transmission of those cultural practices as it is about transmitting faith 
and theology and ideology to beyond to gen, from generation to generation. You have opportunities um, in Black church communities um, a, a, in, a, in a plural sort of way um, to be able to to not only hear and, and um, sort of experience the diversity uh, of Black experience, but also to see how much um, those cultural practices that have been transferred and transmitted down to each of us um, still held on. I can go to churches in different places and sometimes in different denominations and recognize those same sounds that I heard as a child and recognize that same feeling. Um, and I think that, that that sense of, of, of collective being um, I don't want to say unity because I don't really mean it that way, but of collective being of belonging to something um, greater than yourself, of, of something that that has this capacity to hold and to hold on to you in these experiences, I think is what what drives um, a lot of what, and I know for me it drives a lot of what I do uh, is to is to attempt to figure out and to question um, that. It, it, to question what we do and why we do it. The Black church, my Black church growing up was one of the first places um, where I got to ask questions. Um, I had a very uh, uh, liberal Sunday school teacher uh, who's gone on to be with the Lord. I do miss him dearly, but Deacon Melvin Rambo, he would let me ask all of the questions that I had. And when we didn't have enough youth to be um, in Sunday school, when I was around 11, I had to start going to adult Sunday school, but they let me ask questions. They let me think critically and push me to think beyond my age, you know, in a lot of ways. And I think that those kind of formative nurturing experiences are, are common and so critical in um, those kinds of, in, in Black church communities and, and other Black institutions as well. Thank you, Reverend Johnson. Uh, so I want you all to think about this and please respond. Um, in the PBS special, you know, it talks about the reflection of who we are and, um, and the black church is a reflection of, of who we are. It also is a, a hospital that where, you know, all, the, all the, uh, the, the, the ills that we have comes to bear. Uh, so I want you to just think about and, and just talk to us about, um, if the community, if the church reflects the social ills of our country, how does the black church reflect that? And what, what must we do to strengthen those, um, the issues that we bring um, and to, so that we can walk more in faith and, and work to heal? I know that's a, a, a complicated, you know, layered question, but let's just talk about, you know, think about, first of all, the reflection of the, the social ills that we that we have to deal with in the black church. Reverend Mariama. Sure. Well, it, it's interesting because I remember at um, one point in a seminary, one of my professors said um, that one piece I think that's, that, that is also uh, you know, key and unique and a, a thread that runs through the black church is this recognition um, that evil is not simply uh, interpersonal, but that evil is systemic. And this recognition that when we have systems um, that do not see um, the light of God in each of us, that do not recognize that we are all made in God's image, that those systems themselves are evil, unbiblical, um, and worth uh, resisting and fighting against. And so I think, um, you know, I don't wanna say that there is not also a um, holiness element that can be good and challenging in the way that um, it, um, sort of moves people around the issue of sin and we could go into this uh, much deeper conversation. But I think there is an acknowledgement at least beyond just sort of individualized sin that there is, that there, is um, there are sin sinful systems that um, run and, and often run our country. And what, what, our, what our professor said to me that I was like, I don't know about that, but then I came back to reconsider. And I, I will say this true, definitely from the Methodist AME tradition, although I think it, it probably goes beyond. 
Um, there is also a recognition um, in the same way that our black cultural traditions have influenced our theology, that white cultural traditions have influenced white theology and that that theology at times has supported um, white supremacy within Christianity. Um, and the recognition, and this is what I think our professor said that, is that, um, that the black church sees itself as a corrective to the corruption of white supremacy in the white church. And when he said that, I was like, I don't know. I don't think we talk about that. I don't, I don't know what are you talking about? And then I realized how often our conversations about evil and the devil quickly led to conversations about poverty <laughs> and injustice and sort of um, this idea that there is spiritual wickedness in high places um, and low places. Um, and so I raise that because um, there are many things that I don't know that I always growing up syst systemically considered in terms of the theological traditions that shaped me um, that I that really are attributable to the to the black church and I wouldn't have always thought that's where they came from, right? Um, and so, you know, I raise that because I think we both participate in the community because we see people in need and we wanna meet people's individual need. And we are just as likely as any other church to meet people's needs in hopes that they also come to church, right? That is all real. But I do think that there is a, another layer of believing that we are doing spiritual battle against wickedness when we address the um, lived uh, reality for folks who are living under an oppressive system. And so I think both of those layers are present, not perfectly. We have class dynamics in the in black church tradition. We have gender dynamics in the black church tradition. So I don't wanna, I, you know, I never wanna give a flat understanding that we perfectly are all in one place. Um, we are just, we're human, so we're hypocritical. Like if we weren't hypocritical, then we wouldn't be human beings. We'd be something else, right? Um, but I, I, I appreciate that recognition that God calls us to, to not just feed people, but to challenge systems that create hunger um, and to call them out for what they are. And that is not always, that's not true in every tradition. I will admit that I come out of a tradition in, in which social justice is like considered like a hallmark of who we are as AMEs. And that's not a hundred percent true across all traditions. Um, but it is how I was raised to understand that the work we do in community is holy, not simply because it helps people, but because it battles um, spiritual forces of wickedness that exist and thrive in our country. And God wants to see those things overturned just like God wanted to see the children of Israel freed, just like God um, stepped in and enabled Esther to prevent the genocide of her people, that God is against any system that does not acknowledge the uh, dignity and worth of all God's children. Thank you, Reverend Mariama. Um, Reverend Johnson. Your I wasn't thought. ready to go second. All right. So <laughs> I think that, uh, but I, I think that what Reverend, Reverend Mariama raised um, makes me think about how um, I see Black churches um, in terms of reflecting sort of, I don't know so much the social ills, um, but reflecting how as communities and societies, we have to process um, what privilege, how privilege functions within us and how we sort of work within that. Um, and I, I, it, I think that, so for instance, um, when we talk about black churches as being, um, and, and when the documentary talked about black churches as being spaces 
um, that fought for racial justice and they ha held these centers, um, we kind of have to acknowledge on the on the uh, on in retrospect that what we were what we were really talking about at that point was black men and and specifically sort of black cisgendered men, and so we still have to reckon now with what does that mean, or and still had to and have to reckon now with what does that mean about how patriarchy um, enters into our spaces? What does that mean about homophobia? What does that mean about transphobia? What does that mean about xenophobia? What does that mean about how we reckon with um, how the rise of the black middle class has changed the nature of some of our congregants and, and their you know sort of abilities? And how do, what does that mean for what now we not only preach about and preach to, but where we have to now deal with ourselves as being convicted in some of those sort of moments where you can't just say it's them. Because as Emily, as Emily Towns uh, sort of points out to us about this fantastic hegemonic imagination, that there is all of that which is operative in society is still operative in us. And so as we're trying to be these people of justice, I, we have to acknowledge how what's out there and what we're battling is in us and in our institutions and that we have the capacity and the ability, and I think um, very much the, the call and the desire to battle those things, but we have to really take them seriously and name um, that it's not just uh, sort of the, the, it's not just racism, it's not just political divides, it's not just these other things, but we have to navigate um, how we deal with, with gender justice. How do we deal with loving, you know, all, all of what being a black person in America means. How do we deal with that? How do we navigate that? And how are we faithful to what we, uh, to that call to love all of God's children in trying to navigate then how do I, how do I accept myself? How do I accept me in this space? But then how do I also then make space for you and whatever your differences from me might be? And I think that's certainly a challenge for um, all churches, but I think specifically in terms of black experience, how um, how how segregation and, 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 and the heritage of slavery has particularly impacted Black churches in America in that mind frame, I think, um, comes to bear for a lot of us, particularly now trying to sort of think about what, um, what it means to be welcoming and affirming in all that that means um, for our our con uh, for I know I speak specifically about Myrtle in that case, because that's not true of a whole bunch of places, but we go, we working on it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Reverend Johnson. Oh, Reverend Goodwin. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm talking about these are some of the most dynamic sisters. <laughs> so thank you uh, so much for um, everything that you've been saying. You know, your question. I was struck by the sense that I think in the context of the Black Church, there has always been a commitment to um, survivalism, if you will. And unfortunately, how you translate survival um, is a sense of dualism. There's something you have inside and then there's something you show outside. And what you show outside may not actually be how you're really feeling on the inside because it will protect you. And so when I think about, let's talk about the slave preacher who uses a gospel that seems like they want the people to stay enslaved so that, quote, the slave owner doesn't actually know what's going on. But actually, underneath what that person is preaching, all of the people know that they're essentially preaching liberation. But that's not external. And then we translate that to the Black experience, um, let's say in some of the Black church denominations, and you saw this in the, in the movie, where the social ill of oppression of women, well, on the face, the Black church in some ways mimicked that in the silencing of the gifts of African-American women. And yet in the same voice, some of the mothers of the church, some of the evangelists of the church, some of the women of the church could preach most of the men under the table, and it was acknowledged intra-church. You know, I, I grew up with people being like, the Lord, I wish he would sit down and she could just get up because she could have preached. But the church itself externally wouldn't ordain her. And so here was this dualistic understanding that somehow you can't put out what you're really feeling. There has to be something that goes out here that keeps us safe. But then inside, you can talk. And we talk about women and oppression of women. And then we talk about the reality of even the, the Black church's response to an LGBT identity. 
I grew up knowing that the choir director was gay, the organist was probably gay, you know, like all of that stuff was there. And so though the pulpit, which was the outward voice, might be, this is an abomination and not of God, the conversation back here was, you better go ahead and let the Lord use you and sing and do whatever. And so I think the Black church is this struggle of how, you know, when you ask how the social ills show up, I think there's still a sense of survivalism. Like inside, we have a culture that you don't tell people outside. And if the dominant culture has said, this is not right, we don't accept it, you can't allow it, then somehow our response to that publicly mimics it. We will mimic the homophobia. We will mimic the sexism. We will mimic the, the limitation. But then your experience in it is dramatically different sometimes inside. And I think that's the struggle between you got this dualistic understanding of who you are inside and who you are outside with the narrative that my sister so beautifully talked about of warfare. But then the black church empowers you to understand in the midst of the warfare, your tools have to be different. Now, maybe on the surface, it seems like we wanna mimic the same tools, but inside you don't mimic those tools. Your tools become spiritual tools that tell you, you can overcome anything they say or do to you and you know better. So you go ahead and listen and you shake that thing off because you know power is on the other side. You know, so I, I'm, I'm struggling to find the, the strong critique of how the black church did it because I think I got two things. <laughs> And I really had to struggle as a Black person in that church experience to filter out, I, I hate to say it like this, what was real and what was not, what was shadow and what was tangible, because I felt like simultaneously as a young person growing up, I saw and experienced both things simultaneously. And so when people say to me, well, was your church discriminatory? Was it homophobic? Was it sexist? Yes. Was the church liberatory and affirming it? Yes, because <laughs> they both were there. I mean, I literally saw on a Sunday both happen at the same time. Um, and, and I, but I think it was a proof text, a response of an inheritance of what you needed to do to survive, if that makes sense. Without a doubt. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Goodman. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, because you all touched upon this and I, I want to, I want to just, um, um, also touch upon not only that, what you've, you've touched on, on several issues that we're going to further talk about. Uh, I, I want to talk about um, Black women in the church um, and, and also, you know, their leadership in the, the church and, 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 and how does that work? Um, but first, I just want to, I want to say to our audience, this is your time now. If there are questions that you have, please put them in the chat. And we will um, try to answer those. We may not be able to answer all of them, but we will try to, to answer some of them. And certainly uh, we will be open. I will ask, you know, Reverend um, um, Cooper to help us with that. But um, if you have any questions for our, our panelists, Reverend Cooper, any of us, please um, don't hesitate to put them uh, in the chat. Uh, so I just want to read something, if it wasn't for the women by Dr. Uh, uh, Cheryl Townsend Gilks. I have concluded that Black women are fundamentally correct in their self-assessment, if it isn't for the women. The Black community would not have had the churches and other organizations that have fostered the psychic and material survival of individuals and that have mobilized the constituencies that have produced change and progress at every level of social interaction and cultural production, women are present. In every aspect of African-American life and history, Black women have been a significant force, the something within. In every organization where they are present, they have been the key actors responsible for the integrity and efficacy of the operations. According to civil rights movement folklore, one famous civil rights leader said that if the women ever left the movement, he was going with the women because nothing was going to happen without the women. So I'd just like you to touch upon, you know, the black church and the relationship with black leaders. Um, because one of the things that uh, Bishop Vashti McKenzie said was that, you know, we, we understand the social, racial kinds of issues, but when it comes to the sexual and abuse kinds of issues, the black church is 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 not there. So, so 
please just talk to us a little bit about that, that you know, the, the Black church and, and Black women and leadership and so forth. And also the, the issue of, you know, you know, the strength and foundation of, of the Black church. Um, Reverend Johnson, would you begin, please? I'm going to switch around a little bit, if you don't mind. Okay. All right. See what we can do. Um, so I think that it, at least in terms of thinking about um, Black women and, and leadership in Black churches, I think I'll start with just saying that um, we still have, that we've come a long way and there's still uh, very much to, to do. I think that that really is um, in a lot of cases, um, currently at least a denominational sort of issue. So I know that the, the, the documentary sort of touched on um, uh, how the, the conflict that raised the issue, uh, you know, the conflicts in, in, uh, of women and trying to, and the evolution of women in leadership in, in black churches and black church communities that raised the, uh, the incident are the encounter between uh, Jarena Lee and, and Bishop Richard Allen and those sorts of um, moments of trying to figure out what that sort of leadership um, looks like. There are still denominations and, and, and black churches that don't allow, um, don't ordain still uh, in 2021, don't ordain uh, official to official leadership uh, women in various kinds of ways. And we don't um, denigrate their decisions, but oftentimes those decisions are um, sort of made out of spaces out of out of how, people are still trying to figure out where they where they stand and where they fall with um with this with this issue and still wrestling with what that kind of what that looks like in terms of social order and structure and very often wrestling with what uh the bible says and trying to figure out where we're going to take it literally or where we're going to read or how how the bible impacts our cultural traditions but i think in terms of um sort of women in leadership you have these spaces where um we're also we're still trying to figure out um, how the policing of uh, women's bodies in black churches will happen, whether they're in leadership or not. And so I think that that's um, more so the space that I have um, determined for myself um, is where my personal work and passion goes. Um, now, when we think about young black women coming into churches and trying to figure out their womanhood in the context of what it means to um, be a woman be a believer, be black in America, um, that becomes a very difficult and, and often a, a challenging space um, because if we don't manage and deal with uh, the implications of the patriarchy that, that still exists in many black church spaces, it calls for, we still are asking in so many ways for women to be silent in church. Uh, we still are asking in so many ways for women to be, um, to hold themselves to, uh, a, a politics of respectability that is very much not um, something that is asked for in culture. As so we ask for people to sort of portion themselves out in churches and specifically um, when it comes to uh, a variety of experiences, but when it comes especially to a sense, of, a burgeoning sense of sexuality, when you're starting to deal with young women and how do you manage that and what all of this is, what what is my womanhood as it relates to the church? I don't think that there are very many spaces um, within churches. There are many, many sisters doing um, incredible work um, that have either been hurt or are outside of church or sort of doing these in, in extra church and parachurch spaces, doing that work. Um, but it, it it is interesting to me that that conversation is still in many spaces very stilted and very stunted um, as it pertains to. So I think that's that's where my mind is. It pertains to Black women is not just leadership but womanhood. Period. What does it mean for me to be single and in leadership? It's a whole different conversation. We don't even have time for that unless somebody else answer. But I think that just as it pertains to coming to that um, space of Black women and how, allowing Black women to manage their own. Um, bodies in space with others is uh, still a, a challenge for many of us. Thank you, Reverend Johnson. Um, R Reverend Mariama. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I affirm everything that uh, Reverend Johnson raised. I mean, I think that, again, there has been a lot of uh, progress, but still much room to go. You know, I I will be honest that I grew up in a church. My mom was a preacher. My godmother was a preacher. I just, I, I had a somewhat unique experience 
of seeing women preachers all over the place. Um, so it, I never worried that I couldn't become a preacher as a, as a woman. I didn't know if I wanted to become a preacher, period. That was a side note. <laughs> um, but I have had the experience now of, um, you know, I remember one time I was asked to uh, preach at a, um, at a Baptist revival. And because I didn't know that was like actually a really big deal. Like I was only like the second woman or third woman to be asked. And then they called me by my first name from the pulpit the entire time. And, um, you know, and so I was like, you know, so I, I hope what I did do is I did have one of my best sermons. So I hope I preached my way into some, some, um, a little bit more respect. Um, and a couple of people did <laughs> come up to me and say, you know, it was like one of those things. I don't know, you know, many of us as black people is like, wow, you can actually like put a sentence together. You know, it was a little like that sometimes, but, um, you know, I think that, there are multiple realities. I mean, I think there are some spaces in which women have been um, ordained for long enough. It doesn't mean that it's gone. It just means that my lived experience as a female preacher is very different than my mom's experience as one of the, as, as the first cohort of women to go into ministry in large numbers. So what, you know, she wasn't among, you know, the first to period, but there, there, that now, we, the numbers are switched. There are more women entering than men. And we still see when you look at the sort of more prestigious pulpits, it's not even, right? Um, so, you know, the, I think we are in, at least in my denomination, in a period of transition and change. Um, I, I think there are people like me who are like, why aren't 50% of our bishops women? Like, because the church is like 80% women. Right, so that I, we shouldn't have just fifty percent. We should have the leadership in, you know, um, proportion to our our, our um, role in the church. And then there's also these interesting institutions, like the Women's Missionary Society, is one of the most powerful institutions in our church. You know why? They raise more money than anybody else. When the church is broke, they got to go talk to the Women's Missionary Society. And it's a very interesting thing. So for my congregation, I'm like, we're not starting a women's missionary society. Everybody's called to missions. We're not, but I, I understand the historical reason that women carved out a space for themselves where men couldn't join. Cause they knew if you had, if it was men joining, women would have been done all the work and the men would have had all the positions, right? And so they carved out a space that was women only so that they could do the work and control the institution. At this point in my, you know, church's history, you know, our folks are offended by the idea that only the women are supposed to be doing missions, right? And so it's a different reality. And so I think it is both real that we've come a long way that you can have groups like ours who are like, no, men need to go out there and do some mission work, right? And not negate the reality that we have not 100% left behind the reality of the tradition. And, and I think the, the challenge for our denomination in particular um, is how do you acknowledge that history, acknowledge that it's not all gone and make the transition from where you have been to where you hope um, you are going and where you think God has called you to be. And that's not always easy, you know? Um, you know, sometimes there are things that are constructed for women in ministry that I'm like, that just doesn't speak to me, right? Like that's not my lived reality. But I have to learn how to say, but it is somebody's reality. And until it's nobody's reality, this might need to exist, right? Um, and so I think we are in a period of transition um, into a point um, where I hope we're having a much more transparent conversation about power, power sharing, and the disproportionate power that men have in the church, given that they not, they're not in the pool, pews in any way in the same numbers as, as women are. So it, it does not make sense for the unevenness um, in the leadership roles. But I, I don't think that's all going to shift overnight. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Reverend Goodwin, you, you had touched upon this, so I just want, you know, you to add on and, and whatever uh, else you would like to, you know, to, to put forth for this. You know, um, what was being shared, I thought about how in transparency, the imagery of Black Jesus is the Black woman in the church. Because the invitation of sacrifice has been ancestrally in this country, but even today, um, an archetype. And if you think about it in an enslaved context, the Black woman was asked um, by society, and yes, let's even say the Black men in that context, to sacrifice their bodies for somehow the, the total liberation of the community. I think now, even in 2021, we, there's still a request of Black women to now sacrifice your gifts so that somehow um, Black men might have, or really the Black community, and then let's be honest, the world <laughs> might find its soul, its moral courage, its its understanding. And it, and, and I think it's been, the, the Black church has been a microcosm of something I, I think we experience on the national, political, and international stage. Um, need I say Stacey Abrams, right? I mean, it, it's, a, it's again, Black woman as sacrificial lamb who then makes the way for the world, the whoever else to come after her um, to then lead in this other way. Um, and so I think it's important to understand that how socially a Eurocentric understanding of white supremacy, but then also, again, this understanding of patriarchy sort of dance together to then police the black female experience um, in ministry and, and, and all these other things. But there's constantly this invitation of sacrifice and, and my God, there's really no, <laughs> seemingly it's like an imprisoned re reaction because in so many ways, you know, the most, the most troubling example, I'm gonna use my grandmother and the serving of dinner at the black table and how my grandmother made sure, and I watched this as a child, that all the choice pieces of meat went out before she ate, because there was an understanding that she had enough to make it, but the rest of us might need, you know what I mean? And I think, again, it's, 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 it's endemic in terms of how we've chosen to, to exist, but I think part of, part of my struggle, part of my invitation um, as a brother to the, the sisters who I have the honor of being with um, is to, in some ways, use my own voice for the liberation of my sisters out of this understanding that somehow the church has to keep using you as our deified sacrifice. Um, that somehow you must sacrifice so that I might somehow arise to something. I think we, we're ty tired of that because the truth is in the wake of that, the black church will die. Not could, not it's possible, but I think it will because of the things that my two sisters just said, the liberated mind that would suggest we actually care now more about the gifts where the spirit is emanating from and where direction has always come from is problematized by a system that continues to elevate a vacant understanding of leadership and thoughtfulness from the real leadership that was already there. And that's what goes back to that dualism. You know, it was the mothers of the church who always were telling the pastor, like, you really don't want to do that now. We ain't going to do this. But the pastor, the male version, got to stand up in the pulpit and do the pronouncements. It was my own grandmother who said, where are the books? <laughs> in a way that none of the men would. You know, and I think that's the tension. But um, I want to make my commitment to my three sisters here that I want to constantly interrogate even the power and the systems that allowed me to be the first Black executive conference minister, but embodied in May in, a, in this gendered identity, and continue to challenge even the United Church of Christ to suggest that actually maybe my whole point of being the first Black, whatever, is to prepare the way so that my sister might come in and do what's supposed to happen next. Not that I'm not gonna offer whatever, but I think maybe that's the call now um, to for, uh, for the Black men in this context to be the, so, the, the sacrificial people to then say, let me get out of the way because we've had the pulpit too long and now it's time for the spirit to do what the spirit has been trying to do, but we have been getting in the way. Thank you, Reverend Goodwin. So now I'm gonna open this up to, we have some several questions in the chat room and I'm gonna open this up. So I'm gonna to try to read the questions, uh, which I'm gonna see if I can 
uh, handle that with the technology here. Um, so one of them, the first one is the way that the film challenged my thinking was in the area of preacher politician. I did not realize how much this is a tradition in the black church in both the situations of Obama, Reverend Wright and Reverend Raphael Warren preaching to attack them. Petitions with compromising their integrity and commitment to justice. So I'm going to start with uh, Reverend Goodwin, if you don't mind. I know you've been talking, but um, I would like to start with you. I'm going to ask you to try to say a little bit of your question. You froze. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. So I was like, I think I got it, but. So the question is, can Black ministers become politicians without compromising their integrity and commitment to justice? Did you get that? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I, I think not a flippant response would just say yes. <laughs> um, and I think it, it, when you talk about the prophetic imagination that we might have, um, I do think that the, the Black preacher can, um, in this experience, and Raphael Warnock, which you used as an example, um, I think is an embodiment of that. I mean, he's an example of not sacrificing his legacy and his heritage to still have a place um, in the public square. I, I mean, I think that's kind of the... Uh, unfortunately, we have too many examples of those who have, and now we have an invitation for the rest of those of us who might aspire to that, um, to sort of claim the legacy I think he's now reintroducing um, in, a, in a public perspective, which is very different than sort of the archetypal vision of the Black preacher who might have some commentary, but then can also be merely pushed aside as merely, a, well, we just need you to have a commentation on CNN, but then you can go back to where you belong. You know, I think there's a fighting to say this voice is relevant, this voice is necessary, and how we choose to use it is the complication. Thank you. Um, so now the same question for Reverend Johnson. Um, I think I give the same initial answer, at least that uh, Reverend Goodwin did, that yes, I mean, it's it's possible. I think it depends on the individual um, who's becoming a politician. And I think that the yes, it's possible is the same way that it's possible for anybody else to become a politician without com compromising their integrity and their commitment. It is it is the level of your commitment um, to that, to justice, wherever your commitment is anchored, um, if you can hold on to it um, in the midst of, you know, I'm not a politician. And so I, I, there are very many ways in which governments function that I don't always understand the intricacies of from that perspective. Um, and I think that there are compromises to be made. So if one is not compromising their integrity in the way that our governments, local and otherwise local, state, federal, often function, there is a compromise. You're gonna pay on the front end or you're gonna pay on the back end, but you're gonna pay. Um, there, there's gonna be a balance and a priority. And I think it's, it is possible um, when one chooses to make those sacrifices as necessary and rather than sacrificing you know, one's own integrity or commitments to their constituencies for the sake of advancement that they are, that they sacrifice their potential advancements or potential other collaborations or partnerships for the sake of holding fast um, to, to their integrity when, that, when that's the only solution. Now we always seek for collaboration and those sorts of things, but when it's not possible, which one will you choose? I think is um, for me how that, how that holds um, together in terms of being able to become a politician without compromising. I don't seek politics, and so I don't envy those persons who do, but I, I, I wish well all of those individuals who, who, who f find that to be a part of their calling. Reverend White Hammond. I echo uh, the, the, say, the yes, it is possible. I think I have considered running for office on multiple occasions and probably still that uh, that is not a closed door from my, per, my perspective. Um, and that's because um, the illusion of the separation of the personal and political, like that's just not a, an illusion we have in the black church in general. Like uh, um, now whether or not you're partisan is a different, a different um, question, but policies affect people's lives every day, um, affect people's ability to live out who God called them to be. And we see that really clearly. We see the way that um, 
criminal justice policies locked up thousands of people, like destroyed communities. We see the way um, drug policies and the lack of um, support for addiction services has destroyed communities. So I think from, you know, going back to the conversation we had earlier around the systems and structures, that the work of, of, of pushing back on those systems is just as relevant to protecting, supporting, and, um, and uplifting our community as uh, preaching on Sunday. Now you will see, it's worth noting, that most of the preachers who go into office go into legislative offices and not executive offices. Um, and I think that that is because in the prophetic, tr the prophetic tradition is often easier to uphold in a legislative office than it is in an executive office where you are overseeing the bureaucracy of, of the systems, which is not to say I'm, I don't believe that is holy work, it's important work. Uh, but but you you do notice a marked difference. Like I had my uncle who was a um, pastor was also a congressperson. Um, in my tradition, that's like it it's just not really seen as a any more of a conflict than say becoming a lawyer and trying to help people in that way. Or there's multiple different ways. And it's also worth noting that um, for really because of financial reasons, many more black preachers are bivocational you know, there are, there are limited numbers of black churches that had the resources given what their members were making to support a full-time minister. So being bivocational um, is normal. It's the standard. I'm bivocational. Mo many of the people that I, you know, other clergy folks, black clergy folks that I know are bivocational, not all, but um, it is certainly that idea that you also have another job is is also you know a, a pretty standard um, reality. Thank you, thank you. So now the next question I see from the uh, chat is, the black church of old inspired us to fight against oppression to great effect. How does the black church function today in the fight against oppression? So there's two questions here. Um, did everybody hear that one? It, okay, so that's the first question. And the second is, does it still have outcome producing impact? What would be an example? All right, I'm gonna start. Um, oh, Reverend Inez, you're muted. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm gonna start with um, Reverend Johnson. Okay, I was hoping you didn't say that. I thought I saw okay. your mouth moving. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I think that, um, how does the black church today function in the fight against oppression? I think that again, um, it, it functions in much the same, by much the same tools and, and sort of mechanisms um, in terms of being able to instill within uh, um, and, and, and create space and sanctuary for black people uh, within the country, I think that it still can, um, let, me, well, let me say still can, and I think that many black churches today still do. Um, but in terms of that sort of divide in political action, uh, where there are churches who may be more or uh, a less politically active, that, that, they, that, that there's a, um, arguably a greater divide in how, how often you sort of see those very visible churches that are involved in this in in um, the fight for oppression. I think that we it, when we start to think beyond sort of um, and it's important that we meet those material needs. So I'm not get, what I'm getting ready to say is not does not mean that those um, churches who are able to directly meet needs in the community are not important because that's not at all what I what I mean to say. Um, but I think we have opportunities within black churches today to um, engage in different sorts of social action um, and for social justice to provide education um, and, and points of advocacy that are different from what they were um, in the past, but we have opportunities to do those sorts of things to galvanize community and community organizing. And very often today, what you find is that the spaces where the greatest 
um, sort of to to use the, the question, the greatest out producing impacts that we're seeing right now are not being galvanized in churches. And there are there may be lots of reasons for that, um, some of those internal to the churches themselves, and some of those just the function of the nature of Black life and culture and activity right now. Um, but I think that, um, so I say that all of that to say that I think that um, as Black churches have been sort of decentralized or and become a part of the center of activity of black life. And one of the things opposed to how they, as they, as they spoke in the documentary, opposed to the sort of filter of black business and black education and all those sorts of things, we now are one of the things uh, sort of at the center or one of those filters um, that I think that what that really means is sort of calls upon those of us in black churches or in black spiritual communities who see our faith as a galvanizing uh, or and, and a catalyst for wanting to see justice done, it means that we have to figure out how to organize again and how to do that gathering work that has been left undone and therefore taken up by uh, by other other organizations, by other org and other other groups of people who have who have decided there is a voice missing. There is an organizing principle here that is missing and we won't let the work be undone. Y'all just not going to be a part of it because and because we're not feeling what you're doing anyway, then we'll just let the we'll let black churches, black spiritual leaders, black religious leaders uh, stay over there and do what they're doing. And we're going to do this here. And I think that where we have opportunity is to do that bridging work that Reverend Goodwin spoke about earlier and being able to recreate and rebuild some of those bridges to community and really commit to the action that it would take to first organize, first first galvanize, and to just get involved, not to take over, not to come in and push aside what's already happening, but to become a part again of what it is that's happening already, because there's work happening already. And that's not, so that's not, we're not recreating the wheel. We're just getting our uh, toes and, and, and feet and hands out there to do the work as well. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to uh, have Reverend Goodwin answer this, but before I'd like for uh, Reverend Cooper to be highlighted so she can come in and also um, to have a, have a piece of this too. So um, Reverend Goodwin, you can um, respond. Thank you. You know, really quickly, I would say, if you look at the point of the film, uh, this documentary as we watched it, and in a historical understanding of the Black church, it was about the investment and the saving of Black life, <laughs> whether that was political life, financial life, all that. I think the problem that we're in, which is why I was really struggling to think of an immediate answer to your question, is the focus of the Black church now is on saving itself. And I think that really muzzles a voice about being a part of the body politic to make transformative change. You know, I, I struggle with the reality that in 2020, um, the, the, the death of black bishop after bishop after bishop after bishop, most of whom were continuing to be in worship in the middle of a coronavirus. And when press, press, pressed, it was about the fact that if the church closed for as many Sundays as you would really need to, to truly protect, the church would have died financially. I mean, when we're thinking about that reality, so many of the systems and structures are about a preservation of an institution, not the preservation of life. And if we see what institutions die, whereas we breathe life in a different way, I think that's going to be what saves the Black church, a turning away from the saving of the institution back to a reinvestment um, in the Black experience. And I don't see that when I, if I were to take the Black church experience writ large, I'm not talking about pockets who were on the on the marching of Black Lives Matter and all that, um, but I mean, collectively, that's ultimately the shell of what's left, a preservation of an institution. Thank you. Reverend White Hammond? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. I want to first, um, acknowledge that while the church has always been active, there have always been other streams that were not the church. And sometimes I think we have participated in um, inflating our role at times in ways that do not fully acknowledge the other parts of the black community that have played a crucial role. So I wanna say that that's true. I also deeply agree with Weber and Goodwin's point um, that 
so let's just be real. The church overall is shrinking. So therefore the black church is also shrinking. Now we're shrinking slower than, um, you know, the church overall, but we're still shrinking. And we have, we don't have an endowments <laughs> to hold us over like um, many of the sort of older established white churches. So there, there's a crisis of relevancy in the Christian tradition within this country, period. Um, that the church, that the black church is also experiencing. Um, what is sad to me is, and this is across the board, sometimes the things people do to be relevant, in my opinion, are just like nailing the like their coffin where I'm like, is that, that's what you thought was the right way to respond to this? So um, I think the, And as Reverend Johnson raised, there is activism happening. Now here's the problem. I think there are two things that are the reason those activists are not necessarily seeking the church. One is that folks are tired of respectability and the black church is still not wrestled fully with respectability politics. We still hold that line and we gotta have a conversation about that. And the second is the lack of LGBT inclusion. Now you have folks on this call, this is not reflective of where the black church stands on, on the whole, on the inclusion, the full inclusion of LGBT folk. Um, and so it, it's tied up in patriarchy, but when you have a movement that on the whole is led by black queer women, they're like, you know what? I don't really need to deal with y'all stuff that you haven't worked out. We gonna keep marching in the street and y'all go figure that out. And if you can figure that out, we might welcome you in, right? So you have a movement that's led in part by people who've had traumatic experiences in the black church. And they're like, you know, I don't need to hear that from white people and then hear that from black people too. Like, I don't, like, I don't have time for that. So I think that until um, we as a, as a tradition, wrestle with this conversation around respectability and around patriarchy and around LGBT exclusion, I don't think that the movement on a whole is going to be welcoming us in. And I don't think it's a problem that we're not at the center. Because I think when you, you know, what I tell my church is the spirit will move who, where whoever will listen. And she's moving in other spaces because the church is not interested in what she's doing. Maybe if we were more interested in what the spirit is doing and we're led by that, people would welcome us in. Um, but that's not where we are. And I think it's exactly to what Reverend Goodwin mentions. We are so caught up in, the, in our own survival um, that we're not always as invested as we should be. And I see in the chat, somebody's asking this question around climate justice. So I do a lot of work around climate justice in the church. And I do wanna say there are pockets and, and places in which the church is very active. Um, the AME church, I don't know how many thousands of votes we mobilized in this last election, but I, I was not on a single call where people were not like, you need to turn your people out. I mean, when they talk about, you know, black folks turning out, the black church did a lot of work to make that happen. Um, people were very engaged. So, um, you, but I have said to folks, you know, within my own tradition, we should be the tradition of the BLM movement because we have a lot of alignment on policy, et cetera. But our inability to address this issue of respectability and LGBT inclusion prevents that from happening. So I think um, there is still a lot of impact. There is still a lot of engagement. When Trump was acting out, my denomination had letters out, like, you know, he would say something, they had a letter out four hours later. Um, there was a lot of engagement. There was a lot of pushback. There was a lot of mobilization, but I still, you know, believe as Reverend Johnson said, the center of where black activism is, the black church is not at the heart of it. Um, and when you look at issues like climate justice, I think that is a complexity that has a little less to do with uh, the respectability and lack of in inclusion, but the fact that often that space has been occupied by white folks and we're trying to figure out how do we have that conversation without wading into a space that is often shaped by white perspectives and white priorities. So black churches have been very involved around environmental justice, 
when you're talking about dumping in our communities, when you're talking about asthma and health. But the climate space has been a space where things like lowering the RPS has been prioritized. How do we lower emissions? These kinds of policies that are very disembodied, right? That don't actually center what are people's lived experiences, but fight for like reductions by percentages, right? And um, some of the work that I'm trying to do, I'm doing a lot of food justice work, particularly in light of COVID is, how do we fight for climate justice in a way that centers the needs of the most marginalized? We can do that, but it will look differently than a lot of the solutions that are traditionally promoted by climate organizations. Th their big picture like emissions-based policies, people can't relate to that. Nobody wakes up in the morning like, here are my emissions. I'm like, that's not a way to center it. Um, but I think when you center it differently, I've had lots of success engaging Black um, folks around climate justice, but the way I talk about it is very different. And the way I think about the policies, we talk about energy justice. Did you know you could save a lot of money by getting your power from our God-given sun, as opposed to people, you know, wrecking up communities, dumping in waters, children being born with all sorts of like health dis issues. That ain't God. We have another option um, that we can lean to and that would save us money. You, you pitch it that way, people are excited. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's framing um, has been a challenge on some of those issues. Thank you, Reverend Marama. Uh, Reverend Cooper, thoughts? You're muted. That's our, uh, that's our favorite word, you're muted. I'll take 30 seconds because my clock is slow and it says 827. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I, I echo, I would agree ditto with all that has been said. But I also would add to that, I think that sometimes we look back and the zeitgeist moment of what happened in the 60s and the 70s and the black church is gone. That moment, the zeitgeist moment of, of Dr. King and how, how that turned out and how we were all galvanized and swept up in that, that is, that is gone. And I don't know if that's the model. I think that sometimes the model that people want to see again but I, I agree that the Holy Spirit is, is doing different things. Tracy Blackmon, who is affiliated with the United Church of Christ, said something really interesting that I just love when she said, those kids, those young people that were out in Ferguson, Black Lives Matter, that was church. That was church. So I think we have to uh, put on some new lens and um, figure out ways that we're gonna get with it or either we're just gonna be irrelevant. Thank you. So I'm gonna, uh, because of our time, I'm gonna just give each of you just a, a minute to just talk about where prophetically, where, where we need to go as far as the black church, just you know, in a few words, what we what we need to do, where we need to go, um, particularly in this time of pandemic and Black Lives Matter and, and those kinds of things and the issues that we, you know, we're not all together. We don't have all of the you know the the financial endowments that 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 um, other churches have, white churches have. Where do we go from here with what we have? Um, Reverend Goodwin, can you just? Uh, very quickly, I think the invitation of the Black church is to, in Howard Thurman's words, remember the sound of the genuine in us. And I really do mean that as a sound of the genuine, because in this pandemic time, people are hungry and they're thirsty and they're looking for a well that will never run dry. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, because of systemic racism, because of uh, oppression, because of patriarchy, because of homophobia, a lot of the churches, the Black churches' children, I use myself as an example, have gone to sing a song in another land. 
And I think if that continues, then you will continue to have that drain. And then one day, uh, the very same people who could have sung the so songs of Judah will hear a whole nother group of children singing them. <laughs> and so I think that's the invitation for this day and this hour to remember the sound of the genuine and maybe reclaim some of the mm -hmm. children that have gone to sing a song in another land. Thank you. Reverend Mariana. Sorry, I guess, um, I, you know, the question for me is what is the next phase of the black church? And um, in my congregation, as I mentioned, our, our congregation has as many white folks as it does uh, black folks. And um, I think the crumbling of the church overall offer, offers an opportunity. And one of the questions I have is, should the black church be uniquely focused on the situation of black people or might the black church lead the church universal into a different place? Because I do believe we have some things um, though we do not practice them equally about our tradition that deeply aligns with um, Jesus's focus on the lowest and the least. And I think that we could lead a renaissance of mm -hmm. the church in America overall. Um, but that would mean a shift in who we are. That would mean a shift. I mean, that would be a pretty monumental shift. But I'm starting to ask, is that what we are being called to? A radical redistribution of resources between um, churches and, and a, an alignment around preserving what is best about Jesus <laughs> before um, our raggediness as an institution makes people not so interested in him. What I found is they're still good with Jesus, even though they're tired of us. But I, I think that gives us an opportunity to have uh, our finest moment. Um, and I, I'll be interested to see what Spirit does. I think she, mm -hmm. she remixes stuff. You don't get to stay the same. A lot of our music says when she gets up in there, you don't get to be the same. Um, and so I think that there's going to be a pretty big shift if we're open to receiving that. Thank you, Reverend Johnson. I would just say, I, what's already been said is absolutely beautiful and I agree wholeheartedly. I would just say um, at, to add to this, to, to retrieve that spirit of improvisation that has always been a part of uh, black worship experiences, black religious experience to be open as, as, as to to tag on to what Reverend Mariama said to be open to the to the improvisation of the spirit to changing the models to re reimagining in faithfulness and recognizing the one thing that we are um, is communities uh, formed in the memory of Jesus Christ and so if that is what we hold to then everything else can be changed but if we if we if we keep that one thing um, and recognize that we have we have that one thing at the center of who we are and everything else can be different because it's always been something different and we're trying to create and build an institution um, and at some point institutions age out at some point they change and we have to be ready um, and develop quickness of feet and and keenness of vision to be able to move uh, and to be able to pick up and go. That was the story of the children of, of Israel, to be able to pick up and go. And once you start building and putting brick and mortar on things, that's when you start getting in trouble. So being able to pick up and move, I think is very important for us. Thank you. Now, before Reverend Cooper responds, because we're gonna have her close us out, I am just going to read from Ephesians that says uh, 411 to 13, that says the gifts he gave were the sum would be po apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Reverend Cooper, will you um, kind of round us out and lead us out? Yes, yes, I'd love to love to do that. And um, I want to do that by um, just saying thank you all for for being here. Um, I wish I could see everybody's face, the faces that I am seeing you looking pretty good. You're looking mighty beautiful. And, um, you know, we we do this thing and love isn't love until we give it away. And we've got to figure out how to continue to give away God's love because that is free. So and God is still speaking. So um, 
I want to thank everybody, our panelists, Reverend um, Inez Dover. I want to thank Amo and Dylan behind the scenes um, and Tracy for leading us off. I want to invite you to, to the City Mission website. There are a couple of wonderful things coming up. We're doing a virtual uh, pilgrimage to Montgomery uh, in a few weeks, and that will be up on our website tomorrow. We're only taking 22 people. So if you want to do this, you better, you better click quick. Um, the other thing is we'll be doing a green book tour uh, again with, uh, hopefully with Byron Russian uh, in the spring. And then Old South Church has a wonderful uh, service. We lift up one of our, our members there, Phyllis Wheatley, on May the 9th. And uh, Byron Russian will be joining us for that. So there is, there's much to do. And um, we just wanna thank you and uh, send you off with God's speed and God's love until we meet again. And let the church say, Amen. 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 Good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Nice. Thank you.